already late. Good morning. Welcome to the Hill, everybody. It's great to have you guys here uh, on this holiday weekend. Super excited that you guys are with us, and we're looking forward to getting into God's Word in just a moment. If you are a first-time guest with us, we want to make you welcome. We'd love to know about you being with us. The chair in front of you is what we call a Connect card. Uh, if you'll pull one of those out, our ushers will be at the door as you're, as you're leaving, and you've got two choices. You can either drop your card in there, just to let us know that you're here. Uh, and if you're looking for a church home, we'd love to know about that. We can send you some information, whatever you'd like. Or you can take it across the mall to our next step room and turn it in there. And they've got a gift for you from myself and our church family. Uh, we're excited that you're here. We're always glad to have our guests with us, and especially on this holiday weekend. So i got about two or three announcements I want to share with you guys. First of all is uh, our tech ministry. Tech ministry operates everything that's going on in, in here on a given Sunday morning. Our cameras, our sound, our video, all of that is crucial for us being able to get the gospel out uh, on YouTube. Um, and then, of course, for recording purposes to make CDs and that kind of thing. Um, and then to also have our screens operating. And so it's a super important ministry uh, for every Sunday morning to be able to take place. We have a number of openings that are available. Um, you would serve one time a month. Um, they will talk to you about the different places that are available to serve in. Serve one time a month, as I said. Uh, you will be trained in everything that you need to know for that ministry. You won't just be you know, thrown in there. Um, but please consider this as a poss possible way for you to serve the kingdom of God. And it really helps us get the message out uh, to men and women that are hearing the gospel. Uh, you can contact Charles Robaird or Josh Miller. Those guys are in our booth right back here at the back. And so you can go by there when service is over. They're going to be there and uh, let them know that you're interested. And you can talk to them and they can answer some questions for you. So we'd love to have you be a part of that team and get your feet on the ground here on the hill. Our, men's, our next men's fellowship is going to be Friday night, September the 23rd. That's this month, the 23rd, from 6 to 8 o'clock. Build our Life Outreach Center over uh, on the loop. And we'd love for any of you men uh, to come and be a part of that. Uh, Kerwin Smith, Michael Sessions, Jeff Little are the guys that are, are heading this up. Uh, if you don't know any of them, just call our church office if you've got some questions um, and you can find out about what you'd like to bring. They want to bring in some games and stuff to do. We just have a, a real time for us just to get to know each other, uh, build some uh, relationships with other men. And so we hope you guys will take this opportunity to come and be a part of that. That's the 23rd on a Friday evening, 6 to 8 o'clock at our Life Outreach Center. Uh, we have not had a marriage conference in several years. And so we are way past due to, uh, to do that. And we have one scheduled. It's uh, next weekend, uh, September 9th and 10th. Vertical Marriage Conference is what we're calling it. It's a Friday night from 6 to 9 and Saturday. From I needs to sign up for that. Uh, and you've got the opportunity to do that. So um, take a chance and sign up today. I know it'll be something that'll really minister to Eric. So I'll ask you, if you will, to stand. And we're going to ask him uh, to bless and anoint this time. Pray for Joel Don and the team as they come to lead us this morning. So, Father in heaven, thank you for um, God, this opportunity just to be still, to bring our minds to focus, that we'll focus on you and your plan for us. Uh, Lord, and today to, for others who are following Christ, to be in relationship with them, to be a part of life group ministry. And so, Lord, thank you uh, for what you'll do, how you'll change the trajectory of many lives today. Amen. Hey, Harmony Hill. We are David Ann Wilson, and we are coming to Harmony Hill September 9th, Friday night, September 10th, Saturday. Only because we've struggled in it. We wrote a book called Vertical Marriage. We wrote a parenting book called No Perfect Parents. And we actually, every day, are on the radio on a podcast on Family Life Today talking about marriage infinitely. <laughs> but yeah, we have struggled, and I bet you have as well. Because don't you wonder, like, why did God even make marriage? There's certain topics, conflict. Um, 
commute point and blueprint for marriage. And so we're asking you to do, uh, you know, spend the weekend with us, just Friday night, Saturday. Invest in your marriage. And even pre-marriage or engaged couples, dating couples, come and, and join with us because it's really hard, but it's also awesome. But we often pull our two with you. It's going to be a fabulous weekend. We're going to get into the real stuff and God's going to meet you there and he's going to transform your marriage just like he has ours. We can't wait to be with you. All right, that looks ex- all right. That looks exciting. So, uh, th- so just want to know by a show of hands. You don't have to do that. <laughs> just by singing out loud, just worshiping our Savior. Uh, this first song talks about is we're going to sing about His amazing grace and what He's done for us. He does so. Just. Uh, Let's give everything we've got this morning. Um, Because if you made it to today, there's so many things we probably don't know that he moved us through. Uh, Like we turned right and this person stopped. (laughs) But they might not have stopped. We don't know. I mean, there's so many things. But he knows where we are every moment. He knows where we are right now. He knows our next step. So... We're going to sing of his amazing grace, his mercy, and let's just do it loudly. Let's testify outside the walls, try to, like, make this carry on outside the walls. If somebody was out there, they might hear it. Y'all ready? Okay, practice. Y'all ready? Let's do it.
that of him being worthy of our praise. Let me tell you why. In Matthew 6 and 31, it says, Do not be anxious, saying, now he's talking to those who believe in him and trust in him. Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things he will be, will be added to you, he will give to you. He says, don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about that. Trust in me. I'll give you everything you need. And then he says in the last, he says in 34, he says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient for the day. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So he says, don't worry about tomorrow. You don't even know what's going to happen about tomorrow. And today, you're going to go through a lot of stuff. There's a good chance that. But just trust in me. I got it. That's what he said. So that's why, that's one of the reasons that we sing and we sing loud. And I know sometimes we might not be able to even sing. We, we might be in a place where it's hard to sing. It's hard to rejoice. It's just hard because sometimes being in the valley is just difficult. And he knows that. See, that's what's so good about the first song we sing, His Amazing Grace. His unchanging love. He loves us so much that wherever we are, whether we're up or we're down, He loves us the same. And He cares and He knows. So let's sing. And you might not be able to sing at this moment. If you can, join in with us. But you might have gone something. You're just not through something. You're just not ready. Not ready to sing yet. That's okay. It's all right. You don't have to. We'll sing over you. All right? So let's sing over. All right. This is a new song. I know you'll love it. This is 
is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. Ask and he will. Ask and he will. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven.
great. He is holy. So let's just take a moment. We're fixing to celebrate right over here in the corner. But this, before we do that, let's just thank him. Father God, thank you that this right here occurs because of what you did. Jesus, the Son of God, came down and gave up your life. You gave up your life for us. So, Father, we rejoice in our new life, which happened because of you. Thank you, Father. Now let us celebrate how you've washed our sins away. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. And uh, it is a privilege to be able to do a baptism uh, this Sunday. This is Tristan Riley. Uh, her testimony as she came in and talked with Tracy was she didn't get to go to high school camp this year, but she had some friends who did go to high school camp. And while they were at high school camp, they started a relationship with Jesus. And so as a result of them coming back from high school camp changed by the power of Jesus, Tristan was able to watch their lives change. She saw the joy that Jesus had brought to them that he, she didn't see in their faces before. She saw lives that cared about others more than themselves. And it was by that testimony of their walk and them sharing Jesus with her that Tristan said, I want to experience that same joy. And so she had the privilege of going to Tracy's office and being able to learn more about what that meant and praying right there with Tracy uh, Hall in her office to, to, to follow Jesus. And now she takes the next step of following Jesus in baptism. And so, uh, Tristan, with that said, I wanna ask you a couple of questions. Is it true that you know that you are a sinner, that, that Jesus came and he lived a perfect life without sin and he died on the cross for your sins? And do you promise to, uh, because of that, follow him all the days of your life? Then it is my privilege to baptize you as my sister in Christ. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're baptized with Christ in baptism, baptized into his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. Let me pray for us, and then we will, uh, we will worship the Father through the word. Father, we, I thank you for lives transformed by the gospel. I, I thank you that we are a church that gets to watch as people are awakened to new life in you and as they are obedient to follow you into baptism. And so I pray that if there are others in this room that uh, have seen the change in people around them and, and have not followed you yet, or they have followed you, but they haven't followed through in baptism, that that would be something that you would uh, stir in their hearts through your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I certainly look forward to this afternoon, and I just want to say, I'm thinking about having served as your pastor for the last 50 years, that the time has come now for me to step aside, follow God's leading, and uh, our church choosing the next pastor for the Hill. We've gone through years and months of planning and preparation, and I believe God has shown us um, who the next pastor for our church is supposed to be, confirming the elder team and the conviction that we've had. 
that our own Pastor Todd Core is the man God has chosen sovereignly to follow me here in this place. Well, our vote was cast this, la this Sunday morning, and, and I'm pleased that the Lord has confirmed through His people that Todd Core will be the senior pastor, the next senior pastor for Harmony Hill Baptist Church. And Todd, let me just say, wow, I want to be the first one to congratulate you. I'm so excited, guys, to be able to say there's such peace in my heart uh, and just that, that reconfirmation that God's will has been done. And so all of us, we want to join in celebrating you and saying welcome aboard. We look forward to your leadership and what God's going to do through you and what he's going to do here on the hill. Welcome to being the next senior pastor at Harmony Hill Baptist Church. Thank you, Pastor John. I, it's a little bit surreal to yeah. even say that, but I want to just say thank you to you for giving me this opportunity, for your endorsement, and then to you, church, thank you for your vo vote of unity, uh, your support, and man, I just am so excited about the opportunity of being the next shepherd here on the hill. Please continue to pray for me, for Pastor John, as we enter into the strategic overlap period where I'll be able to receive some intentional mentorship from Pastor John as we get ready for that next part of the transition in 2023. I am so thrilled and thank you again. And I look forward to exciting things that the Lord is going to do here on the hill. Amen. Amen. God bless, guys. Thank you all for your faithfulness. Uh, and this is a day for us to rejoice and give thanks to God for an affirming vote uh, for Todd as our next senior pastor. Yeah. I want to ask Todd and Jennifer to come up, please, if you guys will. <clears throat> we'll take this time. Of course, this is the first Sunday that we've got the opportunity to, for these guys to uh, be in front of you with the uh, vote having taken place. Um, one of the things that's been such a blessing for um, our elder uh, guys that operate in the elder ministry is just seeing um, the strong uh, affirmation uh, that has come from our church family. Uh, it was beyond question that this was the perception of the church. It is God's will that Todd uh, lead us as the next senior pastor here on the Hill. And so I just want to say thank you uh, for your prayers. Um, this has been such a journey, uh, just chasing after the Lord on this. And it is such a good sense in our heart and a feeling uh, to know that we have found God's man uh, for the next generation uh, of leadership here on the hill. God gave me 50 years to be here. I'm super grateful for that. Um, and I want you to know in my heart, for Catherine as well, um, we are grateful to know uh, the will of our Father um, for how this work is going to proceed. Um, God has brought us to where we are, and now he's shown us that he has a plan uh, to carry us further. Uh, and we'll see more things done uh, by God's power and anointing. And I'd just like for us to just pray a prayer of blessing on the two of these guys um, and just love on them and let them know. And thank you for continuing to just reach out to them and let them know how much you appreciate them and how you look forward to their leadership. Would you give them another God bless you in that? Do that. Let's stand together. Amen. Father in heaven, um, God, I thank you so much uh, for the evidence of your hand. You made it so clear that it was your will for, um, for me to just stay, to be still, to trust you, um, that you would do a work here. And you did. Um, everything about the hill is because of you. And I give you glory for that. I ascribe all the honor to you. And I'm so grateful that little did we know that seven years ago, you would bring the man of your choosing to be our next senior pastor. And Todd has served you faithfully, and you have blessed the work of his hands with student ministry. And we're so grateful for this firm uh, show of um, support uh, and the will of the church and the, perceiving your plan 
that Todd is the one. Uh, he received the vote of affirmation. He's the one you've chosen. And now, God, we say yes to that, and we thank you for your strong leadership. May your blessing be upon him as he prepares uh, to lead us more and more as the next year begins. May your hand be upon Jennifer. Lord, as the Holy Spirit would just anoint her uh, for service in ministry as the wife of the senior pastor. Bless their home as they come in and go out. Give this man vision to lead us into this next um, phase of your will for us. And we thank you now, Father, in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We appreciate you. All right. You guys can continue to let them know when service is over today that uh, you're, you love them and you're praying for them. They'll be around out in the mall area for you to do that. I want us to look this morning. There are a couple of places we're going to be looking at God's Word. And I want to talk to you for this entire month. We're going to be talking about getting connected. And I want you to understand uh, for maybe for many of you that are new here on the hill, maybe you've never been uh, in a church this size before, um, where we literally, you will have people on one side of our worship service that don't know who's sitting over here on the next side. I love this story about a couple of guys who um, worship here, um, and they were friends, and um, they were talking one day, and uh, so one of the guys said to the other, he said, listen, said, I'd, I'd love for you to come um, and go to church with me. I'd like for you to just experience uh, what I'm getting to experience. And the guy said, fine. He said, where, where do you go? And he said, well, uh, I go to the hill. I go to Harmony Hill. And his friend said, I go to Harmony Hill. <laughs> and he said, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, I, I do. He said, well, um, he said, what side of the, uh, of the worship service do you sit on? And so he sat over here and his friend sat over here. And he said, well, what service do you go to? Uh, he said, I go to the second service. He said, well, I go to the second service. And because they sat on either side of the worship center, the guy over here came in from that side of the building, the guy over here came in on that side, their paths never crossed. Um, and that's what I want you to understand. Um, in a church this size, uh, you can go a long time and not realize there is somebody here that you know uh, or have a friendship with. And it just goes to let you know that there is an excitement about being in a church that can do a lot of things financially, can offer a lot of things for your family, uh, for your children, a lot of ministry opportunities, a lot of training opportunities, and just the experience that goes and that you get from being in a large fellowship of believers. That said, it can also be that after a period of time, you can begin to feel like, I can't make a friend here. I can't get to know anybody here. Because it's like a lot of times, I don't sit beside the same person every time. Um, and so this is a reason why in a church our size, and I want you to hear me on this, it is absolutely critical. I want you to be a part of this family for as long as God has you here in the Lufkin area. And that may be for the rest of your life. And the only way that is going to happen um, realistically is what I want to talk to you about for this entire month. We're going to be talking about life group ministry. And this is how you, you make a friend and how you make a life here on the hill. And there's a passage in the uh, book of Acts in the New Testament that I think is, is crucial. Um, and so if you've got out your life point outlines already, so you can be taking notes and filling in the blanks so you just remember what we're talking about. We're talking about life group ministry. We're talking about making a difference and about making friends, all right? Making a difference and making friends. And life group is about making friends. I want you to have 8, 10, or 12 people here on the hill that you know on a first-name basis, and you're friends with them. You may not know uh, anybody else. You may not know very many people here on the hill in such a large group, but there are eight to 10 to 12 people who know you on a first name basis. We call that success. And that's how uh, you can continue to follow and chase after the Lord here on the hill. Acts 13, 36, for David, that's King David, 
after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. I want us to think about the life of King David. David made an impact on Israel as a king. Um, his life counted. And, and the, what scripture says is, David served the purpose of God for his life. And I want you to leave here this morning understanding that you are in this world to do two things, to make a life and to make a difference. That's what God wants in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to have a life, a life that means something to you. And he wants you to make a difference. God's got you planted here for a purpose. So we're talking about making a difference and also making friends for time and eternity because that's how you make a life. So I want you to look at the first point in your life point outline. Making a difference in this world, don't waste your life. This is just something that I, I want you uh, to have as the driving force of your life here on this planet. That God has put you here for your life to make a difference. That when your life comes to an end, you can say, there was a reason for me being here. I made a difference in other people's lives. And so here are a couple of questions for each of us to ask ourselves. How do I feel? How do you feel right now with where your life is headed? With regards to your relationship with Jesus Christ, um, how do you feel about where your life is headed right now? And then I want you to ask yourself this question. What is my life accomplishing for God in this world? What am I doing that's making an impact for Christ in this world? Let me tell you a story about a guy. And this is a true story. He was 32 years old. And at this particular time in his life, he confided in a friend that he felt really this deep depression in, in the core of his being. And he, said, and he said, this is the reason why I'm so depressed. He said, I, I feel so bad because I would, and he said, I would be more than willing to die. Uh, but the problem is I have done nothing to make any human being remember that I've even lived. He said, I can't, I can't find this, this purpose for my existence. And I've not made an impact in anybody's life. And he said, it's eating me up on the inside. Which brings up a point. Let me talk to you about the three ways that most people live their lives. And you and I are going to find ourselves in one of these three ways. And these are in your notes. The first one is, there's a lot of people who live, the, the focal point of their life is survival. They're living at the level of survival. What I mean by that is, for them, it's just about getting through the day. Their goal for the day is just to make it to the end, to get to the end of their work day or whatever, or to get through the week, or you know, to get through that month. They, these are people who, if you're honest, you'd say, I live for the weekend. I, I, I live for the plane where I can do whatever I want to do. I'm living for the next vacation or I'm just waiting for retirement. What you call that? You call that a survival mode. I'm just trying to make to some kind of finish line out there. What that simply means is my life really doesn't have a purpose. Right? But then number two, the second level of living is success. I live for success. I want to squeeze out a life everything that I can get. Uh, that, and, and you're going for that. You want to make it big. You want, maybe you want a, a big car or you want an expensive car. Or you want a big salary. You want to be in a big house. You want to have a big name in the community. You want everybody to know about you. The, the, the thing about that is so many people, when they achieve that level of success, after they've been in it for about 20 years, they say, you know, honestly, it didn't deliver like I thought it would. Um, when I come to the end of it, it's still kind of hollow. What do I really have? When, because I have all these things. Which brings me to the very important third point. The third way of living is living a life of significance. Significance. That was a life that King David lived of Israel. He was considered by historians to be one of the greatest military and political leaders that the world had ever produced. That was King David. And the Bible ends David's life with this remark, Acts 13, 36. David, now listen, 
served God's purpose in his generation. In other words, you and I are born for this generation. And God has a purpose that he's wanting to accomplish in this era that you and I are living in. You and I are here for that purpose. And so what is it that we are accomplishing for him? It has to be hugely significant for someone to say about another human being, that man, that woman, they did what God wanted them to do. When they came to the end of their life, that people would say their life was a significant life. We are better because of them. They lived out God's design for their life in their generation. I think all of us would want our children to say that about us. The people who know us, they say their life served a purpose. David didn't chase a life of success or survival. David said those things ring hollow. He said what I want in my life is I want a life that means something. I want a life of significance. Look at the truth in your outline. David's significance came from making a difference in the world with his one life. He said, I want to make a difference. I want my life to mean something. So here's the question. How does someone become a difference maker? You remember that 32-year-old guy that I talked about at the beginning? They said he'd be more than willing to die except for the fact he hadn't done anything to cause people to remember that he had lived. Do you know who that guy was? Abraham Lincoln. And 22 years later, on New Year's Day, he would sign the Emancipation Proclamation that gave liberty to millions of people. Abraham Lincoln learned why God had made him. He learned why he was created, why he was born to his mom and dad. It wasn't, he was way more than a biological event. God had a plan, a purpose for his life. He found purpose in serving God in this world as the president of the United States. It was a God-appointed thing. And for you and I as children of God, it is all about you using the spiritual gift God has given you for making an impact in somebody else's life, making a difference in this world. That's what I want grabbing your heart and my heart here on the hill, that this is what you and I are about. So that brings me to number two. Let's talk about gifts. I want to talk to you about gifts for a minute. I want you to think about the things that you do um, better than maybe the majority of other people that are around you. The things that you do that you are just good at are the things that you see maybe other people do that they're very good at. What I'm referring to, I'm talking about natural abilities. I'm talking about talents where you just do something better than somebody else. Now here's the insight. Talents set people apart from other people. And everybody's got a talent. It can, it can vary in strength. Um, the talent that you've got from, from other people. There are people in this world who are natural athletes. I admire them. Their ability, they're just, they're just good physically at doing this, that, or the other. Uh, there are people who can sing. You know, uh, I make a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, I'm not the one that you want to get up on the stage and put a mic in my hand. All right, I'm, I'm okay with that. I can die and be totally okay with that. That's not how God gifted me. Dancing. There are some people, you know, you just love to watch them do it. They got the moves. Mine's not pretty. I, I quit that a long time ago. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not about that. There are people who are able to act. We enjoy watching somebody who can, like, create a story because they're just able to act. They put themselves in it and they, they become that. Um, and, but people come away because they look at others and they say, you know, I, just, I don't have any talent. I can't sing. I can't draw. I'm not a good leader. I'm not good at speaking to others. All right, this is where the Bible and, and its teaching is so revolutionary. Look at the insight in your notes. The Bible doesn't talk about talents. It talks about gifts. Gifts of the Holy Spirit that come to you, that come to me when you and I are born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we become one with him. Everybody who comes to Christ, when you entered into a relationship with Jesus, 
When he became your forgiver and your leader, the Holy Spirit of God came and took up residence in you. My body and your body is the temple of God. God lives here. And when the Holy Spirit came into you, the Bible says he gave you at least one spiritual gift. It was determined by the Holy Spirit. He made the decision of what your gift was going to be according to his plan that he has for you. And here's the definition in your notes. A spiritual gift is a supernatural ability to develop a particular capability. And what I mean by that is the Holy Spirit gave you a gift to be able to perform a spiritual work in this world. I am not, well, I can talk. I, I've always had, it's always been easy for me to talk to somebody. But when I became born again, God gave me, the Holy Spirit gave me this supernatural ability to speak in, with regards to like public speaking and, and ministering the word. And what I do is not a talent. It's not, it's not necessarily natural, but it is a gift at salvation from the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to how the Bible talks about it. Ephesians 4, 7. God has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 12 and 6. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. These are abilities that the Holy Spirit has given you to create a means, listen, to minister to other people. God wants you, He wants to work through you to bless and to minister to other people. Um, let me talk to you about some of those gifts. There, there are speaking gifts. And you see this a lot of times like in a platform like this where it's the gift of teaching or the gift of preaching, the gift of um, exhortation. And then there are people gifts. Um, my wife, Catherine, has um, a people gift. She's got the gift of counseling. Now, I, mean, I just want to be honest with you. When you're around Catherine for very long, you're going to find yourself telling her stuff that maybe you haven't told other people. And you'll walk away saying, why did I tell her that? Why did I tell her that? And I say, Catherine, have you ever noticed that people are around you very long and they just start opening up, gut level, and they just tell you stuff. Um, and I was just amazing. People don't do that to me. Um, but they do it to her. Why? She has a gift of counseling. You just, you just open up. You just feel so comfortable with her. And then she's got this anointing to be able to help you walk through the things that you are wrestling with. There's some people who have the gift of encouragement. They're just people you want to be around when you've got having a tough day. Why? Because they've got the spiritual ability to be an encourager. There's some of you women in particular who have the gift of hospitality. Being in your home is a joy. Just being in your place because you're able to make a home. You're able to uh, lay down possibly a meal or whatever. You just make people feel at home. You're the kind of people that having a life group, uh, maybe in your home or whatever, would be a real blessing to a group. Why? Because you've got the gift of hospitality. So you've got the gift of leadership, of showing mercy. Some of you got the gift of administration. You're an organizer. And God would use that. Um, to minister to people in this world. You've got the gift of giving. Doesn't mean you've got a lot of money. It just means you've got the ability to know where there is a need for giving and you've just got a heart for giving. And you do that and you make a difference in people's lives. There are creativity gifts, the skill some of you have with computers. I, I don't like my computer <laughs> I, because I, I don't know what to do with it. If it acts up on me, if something changes, so what do I do? I go to people who are like gifted and they just know how to do that. It's just a, a natural thing with them. Mechanics or, or cooking. And then there's the arts like dancing and singing and, and acting, playing and in people, particularly in the realm of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the truth in your outline. Whatever gift you have was handpicked by God for enhancement of your natural talent. Listen to make a difference with your life. Use your talent to make a difference in the life of somebody else. That's why God's got us planted here. And your job is the factory where you're going to make an offering to God during your lifetime of ministering to people. David, King David, had a natural ability for leadership. 
And the Holy Spirit, when he came on him, just super enacted that. And David was able to be a blessing to his entire nation as a leader king who was anointed by the Holy Spirit to know how to lead his people in hard times as well as in good times. And they remembered David. They sang his praises because David blessed their lives. And your calling today is to follow David's lead, that we would be those, those kind of people. That's what I've wanted to be as a pastor as long as I've been here. I wanted to make a difference. That was my whole goal. I remember, I, I told first service, I remember years ago, I hadn't been here as pastor for very long. And we had an association of meeting here. The churches gathered, gathered our churches up, up here on the hill. And uh, one of the pastors came up to me when, when our meeting was over. And he meant it to be a means of encouragement for me. And he told me, he said, John, he said, I want to encourage you to stay faithful to the Lord. Um, and, you know, Harm Hill was really small at this time. And he said, I want you to be faithful to the Lord. And he said, maybe someday God will let you pastor my church. And his church was the largest in town at that time. And I know what he meant. He meant that as a true encouragement. He was a brother in Christ. But when he said that, I had a rod go up my spine. And I said, I'm not going to go to your church. I'm going to have a bigger church than what you got. <laughs> I know we're nothing to look at. Our history is fighting and squabbling. I came to a church that had already been through two splits. There were people who said, Harmony Hill, what a joke. There's anything but harmony on that hill. That was our testimony in Lufkin back in 1972. You know what my goal was? What God put inside of me? I have gifted you to speak. I have gifted you to lead. It's not natural with you. It is supernatural. And God said, if you will stay... If I can trust you, if you will do what I tell you to do, I will bless you and I will prosper you in this place. And I have hung on to that promise of God. And where we are today is not primarily because of John, it's because of God saying, this is what I want to do if I can find somebody who will let me work through them. Does that make sense? You cannot imagine what the Holy Spirit wants to do in the place where you are, the, the place where you work, the place where you live. God wants to make an impact on this world. He is looking for a man or a woman that he can trust. And he says, if I can trust you, if you will let me use you, I will work through you to make an impact in other people's lives. Guys, how we live for Christ at our work matters. What you do to earn a living is more than a J-O-B. It is more than a paycheck. It is your post. It is your mission. It is how you change the world in this part of the globe for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the insight in your notes. Are you a private Christian or a passionate difference maker who causes others to realize the void and the potential in their life? God says, I want to work through you. Let me, let me give you an example of how God worked through a teacher uh, and used her gift of teaching to make an impact in, in the life of her student. Um, the school teacher's name was Miss Thompson. And every year when she met her new students, she would say, boys and girls, I love you all the same. I have no favorites. Sometimes teachers stretch the truth. Um, Teddy Stollard was a boy Miss Thompson did not like. He wasn't interested in school. He had a blank expression on his face. His eyes had a glassy, unfocused appearance. Whenever she tried to talk to Teddy, he answered in monosyllables. His clothes were dirty. His hair never combed. Teddy Stollard was neither attractive nor likable. So whenever Miss Thompson marked Teddy's paper, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of putting X's next to the wrong answer. And when she put F's at the top of the paper, she would do it with a flare. She should have known better. She knew Teddy's, uh, Teddy's records. First grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. 
he receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a good boy, but too serious. He's a slow learner. His mother died last year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Christmas came, and the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's class brought her Christmas presents. They piled their presents on her desk and watched her open them. One was from Teddy Stollard. When she was surprised that he had brought her a gift, it was wrapped in brown paper and held together with scotch tape. On the paper were the simple words, for Miss Thompson, from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other boys and girls began to laugh at Teddy's gifts, but Miss Thompson at least had enough sense to silence them by immediately putting on the bracelet and putting some perfume on her wrist. Holding her wrist up, she said, doesn't it smell lovely? And the children agreed it did smell good. At the end of the day, when school was over and the other children had left, Teddy stayed behind. He slowly came up to his teacher's desk and he said softly, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother and her bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presence. When Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and she asked God to forgive her. And the next day when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different person. She was no longer just a teacher. She had become a change agent for God. She was now a woman committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live long after she was gone. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of that school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He had caught up with most of the students and was even ahead of some. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. Then one day, she got this note from him. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my high school class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I will be graduating first in my college class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stollard. And four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact, and I would like you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. Miss Thompson went to that wedding and she sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She deserved to sit there. Miss Thompson had become an agent, a revolutionary for God. Isn't that a great story, ladies and gentlemen? That's what God's called us to. I believe with all my heart for the last 50 years that God could use somebody like me to make a difference in people's lives just by preaching the word, by loving one people, by being willing to go the distance with them, through thick and thin by putting all of my investment in one place for as long as God would have me here. God wants to make an impact in Lufkin. That's why he's planted us here. You are here for a reason. God put you here. And through faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is in you. 
And that God wants to work through you to make an impact in other people's lives for the kingdom. You is to say, Holy Spirit, I want to be available. That I will make myself available to make an impact in somebody's life as the reason why you have me here. I want to be used by you. I want to be a difference maker. That's what I want for us. Let me close with this. Number three, he would say, I want you to come and follow me. And then what you would find in with others who were following him. That is not without a plan. Acts 2.42 to the prayers. And all together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They met the needs of each other. And day by day, they attended the temple in their homes, which is what you do through life groups. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Eugene Peterson in the message puts it this way. He said, that day about 3,000 were baptized and were signed up. And they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Listen, and the life together. That's how it is with the Holy Spirit. When you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to automatically do two things. He's going to come into you. He's going to live in you, just like he lives in me. And he's going to give you a spiritual gift to use for the advancement of the kingdom and how you're going to minister to other people. And then God is going to lead you to be in the church and to be in relationship with other believers. You can't be in relationship with 2,000 people. That's how many members we have. You, there's no way that you can be in relationship with that many people. It's not going to happen. You can only know about maybe 30 people, maybe 35, 40 on a first name basis. So you don't even try to do that. But what we want you to do is we want you to be involved in a life group where you have 8, 10, or 12 people that you meet with on a regular basis, go through the Word of God, and you do life together. We find out you're sick through your life group. We find out you've had a loss in your family through your life group. There's no way that the pastors here can keep up with 2,000 people on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why you have to be in a life group. The life, the excitement, everything that we have here is held up to the ministry of life groups. And that's how we minister to you. And that's how God is going to keep you going on with him. So look at number four, the value of a life group. And the question is, what is the value of a life group that gave it Bible promotion? And the answer is support. You get the support that you need. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them, listen, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Pity anyone who falls and has nobody there to help them up. Remember the Special Olympics? Where the Olympics are going? There's all, they always have the Special Olympics. And uh, I think it was at the last Olympics, there was a, this athletic event for the mentally and physically challenged athletes from around the world. And during that competition, they had this foot race for the athletes who had Down syndrome. Now I want you to listen. The runners were close together at one point as they came around the track toward the finish line. And then here's what happened. One of them stumbled and fell. And the rest of the runners in the race stopped. Everybody stopped. And they all went back as a group. And they helped the runner who had fallen to stand up. And then they started the race again. Isn't that a great picture? It's, it is so beautiful. Have you ever thought that you and I need that kind of support? At some point in our life, we need people to come around us, come alongside of us, and, and help us. And the Bible says that's going to always be true as long as we're on this planet. And that's why 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Encourage one another and build each other up. James 5.16, pray for each other. The Bible says these things matter. And there's going to be a time in every one of our lives when we're going to need close friends. People who love us no matter what. And they're there. They're, they're going to be there. 
Uh, and that, the Bible says, listen, write this down, Ecclesiastes 4, 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. Listen to what God says. Pity the man or woman who falls and has no one to help them up. That's what we want for you. I want you to be involved in a life group. That's how you make it here on the hill. And so today, you can go by the uh, next step area out here. Let them know, I want to be on the list for a life group. Help me find a life. We're not going to put you somewhere you don't want to go. But we can help you get connected. And we want to do that. And for our invitation, look at the last insight. We are never more vulnerable to Satan's ruinage. We're never less likely... Uh, never more less likely to make an impact on this lost world than when we have no significant intimate relationships with others who are seeking to run their race for Christ. The only way that I have been able to maintain a walk with the Lord all these years is a relationship with other believers. If I lived a solitary life, I would fall. I can't, I can't make it without others. And nobody can. And I want to encourage you. Make getting in a life group here on the hill a priority in your life. We're going to be talking about this all month long. It's going to be great. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a minute, if you will. We're going to get ready to leave this morning. Thank you for being here. I pray you'll have a great weekend. Uh, be in prayer for... Uh, the rest of this month um, and about finding God leading you to find the life group that is just for you. That's God's plan for you. We want to help you with that. So Lord God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the ministry uh, of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this teaching of scripture that all of us will fail. All of us can fall if we don't have significant relationships in our life. We need others. Thank you for giving us life group ministry. Thank you for teaching us the value of coming alongside each other and being there for each other and helping each other to fulfill the calling of God on our lives. And so I pray this morning, Father, for the men and women who are here, those who are not connected, that they will determine in their heart, I want my life to count. I want my gift to Lord, that you've given me to make an impact for somebody. I want the fact that I've been alive to matter when my life comes to an end and I come home. We want our life to have impacted others for eternity. And so God, lead us in that, we pray, and to the life group that you have for us. And we'll thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed this morning.